This is Josh Friedman inside the former slave chamber in Stonetown, Zanzibar. You're looking at a room where 50 men would be held here in the chamber at what used to be the slave market here in Stonetown. Now above ground, we are still in Stonetown, which is at the heart of the main island of Zanzibar, the archipelago that is now part of Tanzania and off the, the east coast of Africa. And we're still here at the site of the former slave market and what we have here is a replica chamber not a real chamber the chamber that i was coming to you from in the intro was or is one of the two remaining slave chambers that were here at this site this former slave market in stonetown i believe there were 10 chambers total and the one i was coming to you from it's reported that it would hold 50 men like i was telling you in the other chamber which was approximately the same size down there i was told that it would hold 75 women and children at a time i'm going to discuss a little bit about the history of the slave trade in east africa and particularly here in Zanzibar and Zanzibar was very much at the core of the East Africa slave trade and not just the slave trade in East Africa but the slave trade across the entire Indian Ocean region so Zanzibar at the time well let's back up a little bit Sli something that's really noted in a museum that is in the building behind me, a museum that is about the slave trade that went on here and in East Africa. Now, something that's really noted in the museum is just how pervasive slavery was in the culture here in Zanzibar and in East Africa historically. The museum really notes that slavery was something that existed in all different levels of society or touched all different levels of society and there are a couple stories in there that are very striking one is the story of a woman who was found to be wrongly placed in slavery she appealed and she won the appeal and she was paid compensation as she was freed and when asked what she was going to do with the money she was given as compensation for wrongly being put in slavery she said that she was going to use it to buy a slave another story that's noted in the museum is some slave is saying that his master is going off to war and why is this slave's master going off to war well that's because the slave's master was himself a slave and the the uh, slave who belonged to the master who was also a slave was as a result of this war gonna end up staying with the master of his master and that really gives you a picture of how pervasive slavery was in all different levels of society so come the 19th century when slavery really boomed here in zanzibar in east africa one of the reasons why it could boom was because it was already such a big part of the culture. It was already so normal for people to own slaves, 
to become slaves, to be involved in trading slaves. But then of course there are other factors that, that made it boom here and, and uh, across the region. But if we're gonna focus in on Zanzibar, it's, it's very interesting for a variety of reasons. Zanzibar had been colonized for hundreds of years. So we go back to around the year 1500, the Portuguese took over and they ruled for about two centuries. And then Zanzibar was colonized by Arabs and specifically became part of Oman and it was ruled by Omani sultans. And the Arabs became very involved in the slave trade and I'm gonna discuss a little bit more about that momentarily. So s slaves were being brought from all over East Africa. The museum here shows lots of different routes. They're coming from territory now of several countries, uh, a little bit south and east of here and a little bit to the west. Excuse me, a little bit south and, and west of here, not to the east. The east is the Indian Ocean. Anyway, they, so the slaves were coming from all over East Africa. Different tribes were basically, at, during the boom, different tribes were going to war with each other, sometimes for the sole purpose of gathering slaves. And those slaves would be brought from all over the region. Sometimes they would go on long journeys where, in which they would carry ivory, for instance. So ivory was another factor in the, the slave trade boom. There was a growing demand for ivory, I believe coming from Europe, and the ivory was being supplied largely from East Africa, and there were people carrying, slaves would carry the ivory to here. And Zanzibar is a, a major place on shipping routes. Ivory I'm not so certain about, but it, this was known as a spice island, or Zanzibar was big in the spice trade. And so Zanzibar's location was another reason why it became a very significant location in the slave trade. The market that was here in Stonetown is said to be one of the most, well for that matter, there, there were really markets spread out around this island and around the, the archipelago and the one right here is probably, I mean the one of the ten chambers here and and a little more that I'll explain in a moment it was probably just one of several that were spread out. But Zanzibar was one of the biggest, if not the biggest slave markets in East Africa. And so slaves were coming in here from all over East Africa and then they were being shipped out to the Arab world to various colonized islands in the Indian Ocean and elsewhere. And there were all kinds of people involved in the slave trade. There were Europeans who were trading slaves. There were Africans who were trading slaves. As I mentioned, there were some very powerful warlords who would gather lots of slaves and bring them here to the market. So. In, in East Africa, the natives, many of them were slaves, some of them owned many slaves, some of them owned some slaves. They, they were involved, not all of them, but large portions of society were involved one way or another in the slave trade. I believe for centuries before it really boomed here in the 19th century, and it's important background because probably without such pervasiveness of the, uh, without slavery being so per pervasive in society and the culture, probably would have been difficult for it to boom here. But nonetheless, there were other factors that contributed to demand for certain products that slaves were producing and transporting, the involvement here of colonial powers, including. Arabs and on that note we're gonna head over to the former home of a very prominent Arab slave trader.
Behind me, along a narrow street in the middle of Stonetown, is the former home of Tipu Tip. Here's a look, if you can get of it. It obviously stretches up, and I might give you a bit of a look around the other side. Tipu Tip was this major slave trader that I was briefly speaking of, or was previewing. Tipu Tip was not his real name. His real name was in a long Arab name. Let's just call it that. <laughs> Too long for me to keep track of the entire thing. Tipu Tip, supposedly, he got the nickname because Tipu Tip was the sound of his guns. That's what they say, at least in the museum. I'll try to get you a little bit more of a look of the home. It's quite large by Stonetown standards. He was from Stonetown, born and died here as well, but really made his fortune in Central Africa, particularly in the Congo region. He controlled pretty much all of the eastern Congo region, where it was said that he had a monopoly on elephant hunting and ivory. And as I was mentioning before, ivory was a major factor in the slave trade boom. And Tipu Tip, who lived most of the 19th century and died very early in the 20th century, here's a better look at his home. And nowadays you can drink and dine right next to it. It's, uh, the home is under renovation right now, by the way. Actually, it's kind of a nice setting. We're right by the water here, and you can get a glance at the beach around sunset and a little houseboat or something boat out there. So, Tipu Tip controlled pretty much the entire eastern Congo and Central Africa and controlled some territory west of there that might be considered part of East Africa and he by the time he died I think accumulated something like 10,000 slaves he made a huge fortune but ultimate in the slave trade but ultimately he was pressured by Europeans to getting out of Central Africa, if not getting out of the slave trade altogether, and he returned to Zanzibar as the slave trade was dying down under similar circumstances. The Omanis were being pressured by some people I will explain about in a moment to get rid of the slave trade here and for there to be abolition and that occurred and we're heading back over to the former slave market area to talk about abolition and wrap up this video back at the site of the former slave market here in stonetown there's one major landmark that i have yet to show you here it is that is Christ Church. This is a large Anglican cathedral. And if that does not cue you in, well, then it was, I'll reveal, it was the British who were pressuring Oman to abolish slavery here in Zanzibar. And that happened kind of step by step. So, for several decades, there was a process of the British government putting pressure on various sultans to end slavery, and there were some agreements reached, although they, they didn't really end slavery. Then, actually, along the way, there, there were British missionaries who were coming as well, one of whom was very prominent. He was David Livingstone, who is buried in Westminster Abbey in London. So that, that gives you a sign of his prominence. Uh, Livingstone was on various expeditions 
in Africa, where he was traveling around by land and writing stories about what was going on, but he was a crusader in the sense that he was crusading to end slavery. And his work, along with the British government, eventually led to slavery coming to an end, but it, was, it wasn't such a smooth process. So in 1873, there was a decree that was signed by Oman following pressure from the British government, as well as, according to my guide inside this church, apparently the British also bribed the Sultan, gave him a very large sum of money to sign this decree to end slavery in Zanzibar, but then slavery continued on the black market here for another 30 plus years and ended a little bit after the turn of the century, a little bit after the start of the 20th century. And by that time, Zanzibar had actually become a British protectorate. So control of Zanzibar had passed from the Omanis to the Brits and the Brits had succeeded <laughs> despite previous involvement in the slave trade. The Brits had succeeded in their campaign to abolish slavery. And as that was happening, this building, you might hear some music coming out of there right now, was constructed. In fact, I think construction began exactly in 1873, which was a year when a few things that I was just speaking of happened. So I believe Livingstone died in 1873. The decree to abolish slavery was signed. I mean, the decree here in Zanzibar was signed in 1873. And the church, I believe, construction started in 1873 and it was completed about six years thereafter, something like that. So this is on the site of the former slave market and inside up on and around the altar there's some symbolism right at, at the front of the altar there's a circle on the ground that i believe marks the exact location of where the whipping post was here at the slave market slaves were beaten and beaten and beaten over the course of their their journey and as they were being housed here and it was basically to to weed out the, the strong from the weak and based on how strong they were and how much they could take a beating that that was a determining factor in the value and the, the price of these human beings and then also there is um, right beside the altar inside the church there is a stand that I believe is where the slaves were auctioned. Yeah, that, that was what my guide was telling me. So there's certainly some symbolism of the former slave market that exists in the present day church that is standing atop what used to be the slave market. So I'll give you a bit of a panorama to wrap things up. Here's the church. Over here is where we started out above ground, the mock chamber, which is basically for photo ops, but I was told that this chain is authentic. Can you see the chain? Yeah, you can see the chain. The chain holding the, the bus together. I was told that that chain did come from the slave market here back in the slave trade days and then this building interestingly there's a minaret as you see all over Zanzibar and particularly Stonetown and uh, this building houses the museum and down inside or rather below the museum are the two remaining chambers where I started out this video and now we're going to wrap up this video. I hope it was informative for you. This is as much of a learning process for me as it is for you. This is my first time 
here in Zanzibar in East Africa and my first time out in the field learning about the slave trade, but I'm enjoying the process. I was a bit surprised to find out just how pervasive slavery was throughout society here for a long time, long before the boom, and that's why I wanted to share that with you, and I hope you garnered something. If you did, please feel free to leave a comment below or like or share the video. I appreciate you watching, and for now, so long from Stonetown.